What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. Okay, so I am going to err on the side of caution and assume that there's going to be some kind of huge dump with regards to like the Punisher on the Netflix series. And assuming that there is, we are going to be a little bit dangerous. Uh, really for the first time on my YouTube channel, we're gonna try our hand at Punisher Max. Now here's the deal. In Marvel Comics, back before all new, all different Marvel, for those of you guys who were new to it all, uh, Marvel had basically two publishing initiatives. The first was everything in Marvel Comics that was not Marvel Max. And so it was the Ultimate Universe and the What If stories and the main Marvel Universe where, you know, Steve Rogers was Captain America, so on and so forth. Then you had Punisher Max. And while Marvel said that Punisher Max was really geared towards like adult readers, it wasn't always. I mean, Punisher Max was about as dark as it got, but even Jessica Jones originated in uh, in Marvel Max. You know, that whole thing with the Purple Man, all that kind of stuff, that was all Marvel Max because it was really the only way you could get away with that kind of storytelling. But Punisher Max was like the definitive run of the Punisher character of Frank Castle because this character was so violent and so gruesome that you couldn't really do his character justice by throwing him in the main Marvel Universe. And so the best way to think of Punisher Max is that this is basically what the Punisher is doing or what he was doing when he wasn't alongside the other superheroes. And so it's really just kind of his own solo series, essentially. It's just a much darker and a much grittier take on the whole thing. Now, assuming that, you know, this gets a reasonable reception and we actually end up doing the Punisher Max storyline by Garth Ennis, then we'll go a little bit more in into that. But what this is, is basically the definitive origin of how Frank Castle became the Punisher. And that's one of the coolest things about this, because historically speaking, it's always been the general idea that like the death of Maria and the, the children of Frank Castle is what set him on the road to becoming the Punisher. What Punisher Born does is it actually tells us that Frank Castle was well on his way to becoming the Punisher long before his wife and children were killed. That was just the event that broke the camel's back. That was the straw that set him on the path of becoming the villain that we all know and love and has been played spectacularly by John Bernthal. Man, I can't think of a better guy to play the Punisher than him. <laughs> John Bernthal, if you ever happen to see this, man, I hope, man, I hope you know what you're getting into because you are the Punisher now. <laughs> You are Frank Castle. But uh, nonetheless, so the cool thing about this is that remember, Frank Castle, at least this story anyway, picks up with the Vietnam War. As far as I'm aware, it was not an established fact that Frank Castle aspired to be Captain America until the events of Civil War. And it was actually an offhand comment that I believe was made by Sam Wilson when the Punisher just showed up and shot a whole bunch of villains during the Civil War storyline and so on and so forth. But it was a statement made by Sam Wilson that Frank Castle idolized Captain America Steve Rogers. He wanted to be like him. The difference is that Frank Castle was born in a different era. The goal was that he could basically be just like Steve Rogers. He could be the guy on the front lines, leading the fight, leading the charge, all that kind of good stuff. Now, where that was Civil War and that was the main Marvel Universe, which was far less gritty, the Marvel Max line is a lot more gritty and it's a lot more ruthless in terms of how this is done. Now, I'm not an expert by any standard of measurement on the Vietnam War, but what I do know, or at least from what I've gathered from the research that I've done, uh, this story basically picks up with the notion of the NVA, the North Vietnamese army and the Viet Cong. Um, as far as I'm aware from the investigation that I've done, and, and those people who are more familiar with, with Vietnam history, with you know the Vietnam War can probably correct me, but the North Vietnamese army was basically the communist military front of the North Vietnamese forces. The Viet Cong were basically guerrilla warfare soldiers. Uh, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's the case. But the fact remains here that with Frank Castle, this entire story is actually told from the perspective of a guy named Stevie Goodwin. And what he does here is he basically focuses on Frank Castle as he exists in this particular scenario. The Frank Castle is essentially the second in command on this base. He's the guy who's basically directly under the guy running the show. And the idea is that he takes his forces out, you know, all the time to go on these routine patrols, different things like that. But where other individuals just want to go back home or where they want to get out of the Vietnam War, Captain Frank Castle lives for battle. He lives for conflict. And so while he's out going on these patrols, while he doesn't have like a hero complex where he's not like rushing his guys into suicide runs, different things like that, Instead, he's hoping that it will all lead to like this great big huge massive battle and these things that unfold. This is also introduced with the notion of them basically shooting up what appears to be a caravan. Now remember, when it came to the Vietnam War, again, I'm just kind of speaking with, with research here, the Viet Cong, what made them so dangerous is that if you saw a guy walking down the road and he looked like he had a pack mule and it looked like he was just a guy who was selling goods, you didn't know if that pack mule was loaded with clothes and resources and so on and so forth, or if that pack mule 
was loaded with weapons and bombs that he was just going to start throwing at you. That's one of the things that made the guerrilla warfare tactics in the Vietnam War so dangerous is because you couldn't really spot the enemy that readily. And so because of that, the initial you know response here by Frank Castle and his guys is to just shoot these forces all to pieces. Now, of course, this ends up turning out to be, you know, members of the Viet Cong, but the fact remains here that it's basically just this display of the fact of how gruesome things are. The Frank Castle takes no prisoners. If he sees an enemy or what he believes to be an enemy, they immediately die on sight. Now, again, the perspective of Stevie Goodwin here is that he looks at these circumstances and he says, Frank Castle doesn't care if he lives or dies here. I mean, I guess, you know, he cares about living so long as he can continue to fight the next battle. But when the war is over, the purpose behind his life is going to be over. And so in that moment, Stevie Goodwin looks to the future and says this is not going to be the end of his life that he's going to have a wife he's going to have kids different things like that and so again this really hits home at the idea of how the Vietnam War impacted different people there were some who turned to drugs there were some who turned to violence there were some who just lost themselves in their entirety and there were some who didn't have any real effect at all but it was a war that really impacted a multitude of different men and women in a multitude of different ways now the other half of this is the colonel the guy basically running the show here and this guy is effectively just a drunk I mean he's a essentially just given up. And that's really the state of the entire base here in Cambodia at Valley Forge, more or less, that it's essentially just Frank Castle doing the best he can to hold things together, while at the same time being overcome by his lust for battle and the colonel just, you know, just kind of having given up. Now, this leads to the arrival of a general, and this is really one of the most important parts of the story. And the reason for this is because of the fact that this general basically says, why is it that this place, that this, this hellhole, more or less, is just devoid of anything symbolizing military standards? That is to say, people who salute to their superiors, people who keep the entire base clean, who keep things in check. Why is it that this place really exists more like a frat house than an actual military base? And of course, the response of Frank Castle here is that the entire place is basically on its last legs. And this is when we find out that this is basically at a point when the war is beginning to wrap up. Remember, when it came to the Vietnam conflict, once we basically ended up having the Pentagon Papers released and the idea that the Vietnam conflict was not America run, you know, rushing in for the sake of being altruistic and doing the right thing, but it was a battle of resources forces, it was a battle of intentions, it was a war that was engaged in for a particular agenda and a particular set of events that spanned the course of some three or four presidencies, then that immediately led to the American people who had already hated the war protesting even further. And so once it got to the point where there was a legitimate and credible threat to existing seats for senators and existing seats for presidents and existing seats for congressmen and con uh, congresswomen, the political stance on the Vietnam War began to shift and it became really more of a political war being swept under the rug, you know, over the course of the existing of American involvement. But the fact remains here that this has basically led to a circumstance whereby the U.S. is essentially pulling out. And so the arrival here, this general showing up at, you know, Valley Forge, is designed for the purpose of analyzing whether or not it's even worth keeping it open. And if it is worth keeping it open, is it going to have the kind of resources that are necessary in order to maintain a long haul? If it's not worth keeping open, then the question is why? And so the idea is that Frank Castle is basically forced with this scenario that he may lose the basis behind his existence here. He may end up losing the reason for why it is he's here in the first place. He wants to fight in this war. He wants to keep fighting in this war because he believes that he can legitimately win it on his own. And so the result is that he actually leads the general into the into the line of fire of a sniper. And he basically tells this general, hey, look, what you're looking for in terms of why this thing, you know, why this base needs to be here is right over there. Just, just go over there, go, you know, peek your head out, take a look, and you'll see what we're talking about. As soon as he steps up, the general's head's blown off. Now, the funny thing about this is that Frank Castle was actually blocking a sign that said, danger, sniper at work, dawn to dusk. And so because of the fact that the general just simply wasn't paying any attention because he wasn't looking around, he ends up being a victim of this of this sniper. But what this does is it shows us the lengths that Frank Castle is willing to go to in order to make sure that he's still able to do the kind of things that he wants to do to continue this battle. Now, for the most part, this is just Frank Castle being Frank Castle. This is him just kind of swept up in the idea that he can legitimately win the Vietnam more by himself. In terms of Frank Castle tumbling down this rabbit hole and eventually becoming the Punisher, this begins to take place when he begins hearing the voice of some disembodied individual. Now, this is one of the crazy things here is because Garth Ennis gives it to us in a way where it could be a number of different things. It could be Frank Castle himself in the form of his subconscious. It could very well be the devil himself. There's no real explanation on who this voice is in the immediate. Instead, it's just a voice there. But the voice basically mimics the perspective of Frank Castle and saying that, yes, the general was trying to screw you guys over. You know, you knew that the, the war was going to come to an end at some point or another, but the general was trying to speed it up. But with the general being dead, now the war can keep going on. Now you can keep fighting. Now you can be the hero. Now you can do what it is that you love and go into these, these investigations, go into these marches and so on and so forth and continue the path of trying
trying to win this war on your own. Now, the other side of Frank Castle also comes to fruition when Frank Castle and this, this platoon of sorts is led on one of their tracks. And of course, they actually end up coming across a sniper who manages to take out a couple of people. But Frank Castle, as fearless as he is, instead of backing off, picks up the M60. Now, for those of you guys who have read Punisher Max, who basically read the, sto uh, the, the story arc in the beginning, which picks up with the idea of Frank Castle as part of uh, as part of Marvel Max, that M60 moment where he just unloads, there's, there's this amazing moment at the beginning of the story. He runs into a building, shoots a mob boss, and then runs outside and starts counting down. He's like, you know, five seconds when they realize what it is that happened, and then like three seconds once they marshal their forces, and then like one second when they get outside. And then once they're there, he just like yanks off this giant cloth, and there's this M60 that just starts spraying down all these soldiers. It's one of the coolest moments, you know, ever in the history of a Punisher story. I absolutely love the way that it opens. But the fact remains here, in this little tidbit, instead of Frank Castle cowering away, instead of him kind of running away, he literally grabs the M60 and just starts opening up on this sniper. And so what this does is it basically brings in the idea that Frank Castle is a man without fear. But that's one of the most dangerous things about this, is because in this particular scenario, the way this story is being written by uh, by Garth Ennis, and the way that, the, that Frank Castle is perceived by Stevie Goodwin and the other members of this platoon, is that a man who has no fear is a man that's not afraid of losing anything. And a man who's not afraid of losing anything is a man that has nothing to lose. And so in the end, it's not as though Frank Castle looks around and says, oh man, I may end up losing my platoon. Instead, Frank Castle cares only for himself. Frank Castle cares only for making sure that he can continue this war. And if it means that all the other members of the platoon are killed, then that's just the way it goes. And so that's what makes it so dangerous is because Frank Castle doesn't have their backs and none of them can trust him. But the problem is that they're all dealing with the Vietnam War in their own way. Now, this is where the story begins to get really into the vein of Marvel Max. And the reason why is because of the fact that while they are able to take out one of these snipers and while she does try to, you know, try to kill herself, ultimately, in the absence of Frank Castle, some of the members of the platoon attempt to rape her. And that's one of the huge things about this. When it comes to Punisher Max, Garth Ennis does not shy away from anything. If you've read Punisher Max, the Slaver's Arc is a perfect example of that. It is an, an arc that deals with human trafficking. And Frank Castle... <laughs> Man, Frank Castle lets them have it. It is, it's, I've never seen anything like that in a comic before, and it's absolutely mind-blowing the way that it's written. It's beautifully done, but it's crazy the way that it's all depicted. But the idea here is that once Frank Castle arrives on the scene, he realizes that this platoon is engaging, you know, in this, this heinous act. And this is the moral principle of Frank Castle. Despite the fact that Frank Castle doesn't care, despite the fact that he has no problems killing anybody he considers to be an enemy, there is still a kind of line that they don't cross. And that's the irony to all this, is because this is the the one thing about Frank Castle that never changes. The one thing about Frank Castle that never goes away. Frank Castle is always okay with killing the enemy. He's never okay with killing the good guys. Frank Castle believes in punishment. He believes that people who do bad things deserve to die. The instant that a man breaks into another man's house, he sacrificed his right to life. Whether he knew it or not is irrelevant. The fact remains, that's the price he's going to pay. That pleading ignorance is no excuse for committing such a heinous act. That's the life of Frank Castle. That's how he views the world. That's how he does things. What this does is it tells us that despite Frank Castle being such an anti-hero, such a terrible human being in a lot of different ways, there's some lines that you just don't cross. And so that's one of the coolest things about this is because what ends up happening is, of course, he basically shoots this woman and arguing that it was going to be the end of her. I mean, no matter what happened, you know, even if he were to force all the soldiers off of her and she were to be handed over to the U.S. military, you know, there would have been guys out there, groups out there that would have had their way with her while they were trying to interrogate her. If she wasn't able to provide the information that they wanted, then they would have killed her. Her life up until the point that she died would have been one of absolute misery and absolute horror, a terrible situation to be in. And so to simply just kill her that way, Way, is to basically spare her a miserable existence. But not only that, because of the fact that one of the members of his platoon had tried to rape a woman, Frank Castle in turn drowns him. And that's why this is so big, is because again, it's this moral standard that Frank Castle has. Now, of course, Stevie Goodwin sees the entire set of events unfold, but it's the moral compass that Frank Castle has. There are lines that you don't cross. And that's why Punisher Max is so cool. It's because unlike the main Marvel universe, where the Punisher has fought Ghost Rider, and where the Punisher has fought Spider-Man, and where the Punisher has fought 
fought the Avengers single-handedly and won. It's this story, this, this line of events that crop up, and it basically says, yeah, but like the Punisher has a moral compass. He has a viewpoint. If you are a superhero and you do something that the Punisher considers to be an evil act, he will find you and he will kill you. That's what he does. That's his role in the world. And if he doesn't kill you, he will die trying. Whether it's a friend, whether it's an ally, whether it's a brother or a sister, there's no gray area in the world of Frank Castle. There's black and there's white. Hence the reason why there's that really great story arc. Black is white and up is down. It's it's just one of the coolest things. There's this amazing monologue that he has. Let me let me sidetrack here for a second to give you guys some perspective about, about Punisher Max. There's this amazing monologue that, that Punisher has where he goes in and he's clearing out this, this house with all these drug dealers and criminals and so on. And like as he's going through, he starts talking about this dream that he has. And in this dream, he doesn't stop. Like he doesn't stop at the criminals and he doesn't stop at like the drug dealers and the crooked politicians and so on and so forth. He kills everybody. He kills every single person that he considers to be a bad guy. And then he looks at society. He says, you elected those corrupted, you know, politicians. You allowed people to steal from others. You watched muggings and rapes and different things like that happen and chose not to report anything. You are as bad as the villains that I'm facing. And then in turn, Frank Castle goes to turn his guns on the average person and then wakes up right before he pulls the trigger. It's just this amazing monologue that, that he that he does. It's one of the coolest things. Little moments like that are what make the story so cool. But the fact remains here, the idea of him moving on the road of becoming the Punisher is when the Punisher pulls Stevie aside and says, why didn't you speak up when you saw me drowning that guy? And of course, Stevie's whole idea is, well, you know, I was terrified, but why did you do that? And the Punisher, you know, Frank Castle simply says, because I wanted to punish him, because he deserved punishment for his actions. And so again, that's what makes this such a hallmark thing is because this is Frank Castle becoming the Punisher. This is Frank Castle becoming the character that we've all come to realize is a guy who has no gray area in his moral viewpoint. It's black and it's white. You're a good guy, you're a bad guy. You know, it's, it's one of those crazy things about his character, but the fact remains that with Frank Castle in a position where he actually has the ability, or at least, you know, kind of toys with the notion of killing the Colonel. Ultimately, he ends up backing out on this particular role. And instead, uh, he really begins to marshal his forces towards the idea of essentially the Viet Cong forces and the North Vietnamese army launching this final attack against the Valley Forge retreat. Now, the reason why this is kind of interesting is because Frank Castle has no reason to believe this is absolutely true. Instead, he's just kind of running on a gut instinct. But the gut instinct turns out to be accurate when there's illumination in the middle of a firefight and we actually end up seeing just hundreds of these soldiers descending on on Frank Castle's platoon and so of course grabbing the M60 and immediately just spraying away it's an absolute bloodbath and this is really where Frank Castle breaks I mean this is the moment right here this is the moment where he switches over from being Frank Castle to being the Punisher and this comes in the form of the fact that his guys are running low on ammo his guys are running low on resources you know it's a war of attrition they're outmanned they're outgunned they cannot last forever and so what ends up happening here is that where the the colonel essentially shoots himself so he doesn't have to deal with this particular onslaught and Frank Castle is the one guy who's basically left alive or at least seems to be the one guy who's basically left alive in the face of Stevie Goodwin basically being killed off, the voice begins to ring into the mind of, of Frank Castle. And it's such a great moment because the voice says, I know that you want to live, Frank Castle. I know that you love blood. I know you love death. I know that you believe that there are bad people out there who need to be punished. I can make that happen for you, Frank. I can give you the strength to kill the bad guy. I can give you the strength to engage in this battle that will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. All you have to do is just say yes. All you have to do is hand yourself over, Frank. And if you do that, Frank, I will give you everything you need to survive the night. And Frank Castle hands himself over. Now, we don't actually see the particular firefight when Frank Castle loses his mind. Instead, we pick up the morning after and Frank Castle single-handedly killed every single one of these guys who had descended on the base. Now, the implication here is that somewhere along the line, he ran out of ammunition and he basically just started using the butt end of an M16 and bashing people's brains in. But what we're also kind of shown here, at least what seems to be taking place here, is that Frank Castle just kind of gave in to his inner devil. He gave into his inner demon, lost himself in the fray of all this. And that's what makes this so cool. That's why I say this is the moment that Frank Castle snaps because he crosses a line that he can't come back from. And so as the sole survivor of this massive attack, when he's brought back home, he's hailed to be a hero. The problem with this is that when he left Vietnam, Frank Castle believed that he had left that life behind him. Instead, he didn't. As soon as he's with his family, as soon as he's back with the people that he cares about, that voice 
starts ringing home. That voice starts cropping up and saying things like, I've been at this a lot longer than you have, Frank Castle. I've been doing this for a lot longer than you. And I told you, when you handed yourself over to me, there would be payment. Payment would come due. I would come knocking on your door. And now is the time for you to pay the price. What this does is it basically shines this perspective in saying that the Punisher's family, the death of his wife Maria, the death of his kids, that's not how he became the Punisher. He became the Punisher a long time before that. They simply just gave him a reason to adopt a name. Their death gave him motivation. It gave him drive and it gave him a reason to go on this massive killing spree, attacking every single villain that he came across, no matter where they were, anywhere in the world. But with that being said, guys, uh, Punisher Max, Punisher Born, this is extremely tame in comparison to like the rest of the Punisher Max line. I mean, after this, things get, I mean, like with the, the main Punisher story, <laughs> things get really violent really fast, but it is a really, really cool story. It's extremely well done the way that it all comes together. But anyway, guys, we're gonna go ahead and bring this video to an end and I will catch you all later. Peace.